Hey there, my name is Matthew, and welcome to the intro to After Effects for 2D VFX. In this lesson, I'll be demonstrating a few common and useful After Effects techniques to hopefully help you on your journey to becoming a 2D VFX artist. This video is mainly aimed at those who don't really know After Effects. We'll be creating this animated cursor here, and in doing so, we're going to cover both the basic After Effects Glow and a paid plugin called Deep Glow. Uh, along with blurs, masks, keyframing animation, and more. We'll also be exporting this animation as a sprite sheet for use in game engines using a free extension called Sheeta, which you can find on aescripts.com. Don't forget to download the totally free cursor asset and grab that extension if you want to follow along. You'll find links below in the description. So let's delete all this and start fresh. First, we'll save our project, so we can simply quick save as we go by using Control S. Next, we'll import the cursor artwork, which you can do in a few ways. You can go up to File, Import, or you can simply double click in the project panel. Next, we'll want to create what's called a composition. You can hit Control N, or go to the composition menu and hit New Composition, or you can click this button here. But we're actually not going to do any of that. We're going to grab our cursor here and just drag it directly onto that button. You'll see this also creates a composition, uh, and doing it this way automatically uses the information available from the asset. So since it's just a still image, it's only grabbing the 64 by 64 pixel sizing and dimensions. Uh, but if this was a video or an image sequence, for example, it would also use the frame rate and duration. This will definitely save us some steps in the future. From here, we're going to hit Control K to open our composition settings, uh, which you can also find up in the composition menu. It's showing our composition name here as cursor, which was the name of the asset. Make sure to set the duration to 16 frames and keep this at 24 frames per second. Next, we're going to duplicate our cursor layer uh, by selecting it and pressing Control D. Uh, then we're going to pre-compose that new layer by right-clicking on it and selecting Pre-Compose. We'll name this composition Gem. You can leave the top option selected here and hit OK. We'll double-click on it and open the composition we just created. So this asset is pretty small, uh, so we're going to get a lot of use out of using the mouse wheel here or the Z key uh, to let you zoom in. Um, and if you click and hold the middle mouse, uh, you can drag the image around. You can also hold the space bar while left clicking if that's something that you're used to from other programs. So using those tools will help us here as we start to mask out this gem. Uh, you can add a mask by right clicking on the layer and hitting new mask or using the pen tool up top, kind of like this, uh, or clicking on the shape tool and drawing it on. Uh, you can also double click the shape tool when doing it that way, make sure you have the layer selected or you'll end up creating a new shape layer instead. Once you have the circle drawn on here, uh, we'll double click it and uh, adjust it to fit the gem shape as best we can. Hitting enter here will finalize the transformation on the mask. If you wanna modify any of the mask properties uh, like feathering it or expanding or contracting it, you can twirl down the layer here and it will show you the masks or you can select the layer and press the M key. So because we might want to manipulate this gem later, we're going to center its anchor point while we're in here. So to do that, we're going to need guides and rulers. Uh, so we go up to the view menu and turn on the rulers. Let's also turn on snap to guides. Uh, another way to turn the rulers on, you can press control R. It's a nice way to quickly toggle them on and off. Let's set a guide vertically and horizontally centered over the gem as best we can. Uh, and then we can use the little square nodes to line up our image uh, over the guides. Uh, you can use the arrow keys to nudge the image a few pixels uh, to center it as best you can. Once the square nodes are lined up underneath the guides, it'll show us the center of the gem here based off of the shape of our mask. So if we press the Y key, uh, it brings up the Edit Anchor Point tool. So then we can click and drag that, uh, and it will snap to the center of the intersection of the guides. 
So this looks good. Uh, we'll come back here later. But for now, let's go back to our cursor composition and hide the cursor layer button to see uh, our gem masked out, which looks good. So now let's add some glow to our gem. Uh, let's select the gem layer and go to the effect menu, stylize, and glow. Now the glow properties uh, appear in the effects panel on the right side of my screen, uh, but this likely will be in another location for you, especially if it's your first time opening After Effects. You can undock any panel here and move it around to suit your preference. So I've just put mine on the right here. So if you pull down the threshold property here, you'll see that the effect increases. The threshold defines which pixel values the brightness applies to. The closer to zero, the more values it will include and the brighter the effect will get. Adjusting the radius simply expands the effect over a wider area, uh, and the intensity defines how hot or bright the overall effect is on the affected pixels. You can also duplicate the effect uh, by selecting it in the effects panel or on the layer and pressing Control D. AE's stock glow isn't great, uh, but it can do in a pinch. So what I tend to do with it is have a tighter bright glow and an additional softer glow that's a little bit wider in radius on top of it to give it some bloom. To find the effects on the layer itself, uh, you can click on the layer and press E and it will show you uh, your entire effect stack. So for now, I'm going to delete this pair of glows uh, for a moment, but we'll add them back in a sec. We're going to take a second to talk about transfer modes. Uh, we'll duplicate our layer here by selecting it and again pressing Control D. Uh, to the right, you should see a drop down menu that reads Normal, um, which, if you don't see, check the bottom left and make sure the center button, Transfer Controls, is enabled. With the top gem layer selected, uh, let's click on that drop down that says Normal and go up to where it says Add and click on that. You'll notice the gem immediately gets a bit brighter here. We'll add the glow back and also change the layer color here by selecting the light brown square on the left and selecting a new color. Uh, this just helps me visualize uh, and differentiate my layers at a glance, especially as the layer stacks start to get pretty big. So let's again adjust our glow, uh, this time on the add layer. Uh, we'll duplicate it just like before and adjust it until we're happy with the result. So that's looking all right. Let's go ahead and add a pulsing animation to this glow layer. We'll select the layer we want to animate and press T for opacity uh, to see the transform opacity property. With the playhead on the first frame in the timeline, we'll set the opacity value to 50%. We'll then click on the stopwatch next to opacity, uh, which will set a keyframe and turn on keyframe animation. We'll then move the playhead to the middle of the timeline at eight frames and set another keyframe by typing in a new value. Let's try 75%. Uh, then we'll put another keyframe at the end of the timeline to 50% again for a loop. We can press the numpad zero key here for a RAM preview of the animation. And we'll actually want to scooch the keyframe at the end here. Uh, all the way to the 16th frame for a seamless loop. So let's double click on the gem layer to open it up and uh, we'll select the cursor layer and press R to bring up the rotation property. Uh, with the playhead at zero, just like before, uh, we'll press the stopwatch to add a keyframe at this point in the timeline and then go ahead to the last frame and put a value of one in the leftmost field here for a single 360 degree rotation. Um, we'll also scooch this one over a frame just like before, uh, making sure the last frame leads back into the first frame. Now if we head back into our cursor composition, we'll see our glowing gem rotating and pulsing. Uh, it looks a little unnatural to be honest, so let's add some blur here. Select the top layer and then go up to the effect menu and then blur and sharpen. And let's do a radial blur. This will add it to the bottom of your effects stack, uh, which means the glows apply first. In the effects panel, click the center reticle 
and then click on the center of your gem to define the center of the blur. Uh, we'll make sure that the type here is set to spin. Uh, and you'll also want to solo the layer so you can see the changes from the effect more clearly. After blurring the top layer, let's apply the blur to the layer beneath it as well. We'll copy and paste the effect from one layer to the other by selecting it and pressing Control C, and then selecting the layer below and pressing Control V to paste. You can adjust the blur here to taste. Uh, and then unsolo the layer and watch your animation. It's not too bad. So now I'm going to quickly run through a different glow method using a paid plugin called Deep Glow. Uh, it's about 50 bucks on aescripts.com. There are a few glows out there at different price points, but I find this one to be the best for the money uh, in that it treats colors and intensity uh, much more respectfully than After Effects stock glow. While I'll be using it in my other lessons, uh, it's not required. You can definitely get by with the AE stock glow, but you will notice a difference in color and look. Let's select the top layer and press E to show the effects if they weren't already there. And we'll turn off our original two glows. With that layer still selected, go to the effect menu, plug in everything, deep glow. The default radius is very large, so let's turn it way down to similar values of our original glows. And then we'll duplicate it again and make a tighter glow just like before and tweak the exposure setting and radius uh, until we get something we like. Uh, it's a little hot, so I'll select the layer and press U to see my keyframes and turn the opacity down at the 8 frame mark to about 65%. Uh, the U key is a great hot key to remember. Uh, it reveals all properties with keyframes, either on a selected layer or all layers if none are selected when you press the key. So let's do a ramp preview. Yep, yeah, it's looking pretty good. I think I'm happy with this. So we're ready to export. Uh, let's save quick and make sure you have Sheeta installed properly before moving forward. Uh, we'll export the sprite sheet first, which will primarily be used for implementation in the game engine. Uh, so to do that, we'll select the window menu. And on the bottom, you should see uh, Sheeta.jsx. So click on that, and this brings up the Sheeta UI panel. You can dock this anywhere in your UI by dragging it from the top tabbed area with the panel name. Uh, in your project panel, let's select the composition you want to export as a sprite sheet. So for us, that's the cursor composition. Then in the Sheeta panel, select the image type, uh, which for us will be TGA, uh, as it's the preferred type for both Unity and Unreal. Make sure POW2 is checked. Uh, this is very important. So while Sheeta allows you to customize the size and distribution of the sprite sheet, um, exporting as a power of two in video games is standard. Uh, game engines are optimized to read power of two sizing. Uh, if it's a different size, it'll have to go through more computations to convert, and there will be a performance cost during gameplay. So with that, uh, just click Save Sprite Sheet and choose where you want it saved. Uh, and that's it. Um, so let's bring it back into AE and make sure it exported properly, and it's what we want. And there you go. Lastly, uh, we'll just export a video for quick viewing. Uh, this can be useful for previewing uh, when sharing remotely for feedback uh, for your social media or for a, simply a portfolio piece later. Um, so we'll go up to File. Export, add to render queue, uh, and this will bring up your render queue. So click where it says lossless here, and we'll change it from AVI to QuickTime. And this is our personal preference, but uh, we'll leave it on the animation codec, uh, which is a lossless format, uh, which means it won't compress the colors or the animation, but the file size will be larger. Since it's a short animation, the difference will be pretty negligible. Uh, QuickTime animation also has the option of exporting with an alpha here for transparency. So if you want that, uh, feel free. 
but uh, we don't really need it for now, so I'm not going to do that. So if everything looks good, uh, press OK. Uh, now we'll click where it says cursor.mov and choose where you want it to render to. Uh, name it and click Save. Then hit that Render button. Uh, you'll hear the ding, and there you go. Uh, simply bring it back into AE to preview and make sure it worked. And hey, it works. There you go. So that'll wrap up uh, this quick and dirty intro to After Effects. Please like and subscribe for more and let us know in the comments if you have any questions or what you found useful or what you're missing. Uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Be sure to check out the VFX Apprentice course, 2D VFX for games, TV, and film, where you'll learn how to make an awesome variety of 2D effects and put them into a playable game demo. Uh, it's super cool. Uh, the link is in the description. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you next time.